so another three or so to half Barber Benji. Down the back stretch they go, and Happy Runner is the leader with Balladeer just a half length back in second. Another two lengths to American Admiral in third, and then Candy for Carmel, four lengths off the lead. Another two to half Barber Benji. There's a half mile left to run, and it's Happy Runner showing the way throughout. Three quarters of a length, Balladeer not letting him get loose on the front end. American Admiral Blue Silks hugs the rail and is a threatening third. It's another length and a half back to Candy for Carmel and half Barber Benji. They pass the 5 sixteenths, and now Balladeer takes a very narrow lead. Happy Runner, they're joined by American Admiral, who's let loose on the outside, and American Admiral with bigger strides up to take the lead with a furlong left to go. Balladeer, happy runner fighting on, 16th pole, American Admiral edging away, and it's American Admiral taking care of business as the heavy chalk. American Admiral scores by two. Balladeer, happy runner, and a photo that goes to Candy for Carmel. The last one to load will be Sweet Duck going in, and they're off. Roman Empress out alertly with a host of pursuers, Tizzy Twister, Warren's Queen Bee, and Sweet California is faster than all of them. Sweet California takes the lead, joined by Tizzy Twister, and now Tizzy Twister in front. Warren's Queen Bee, two off the pace in third. Then Roman Empress, mix and matches in between horses. Sweet Duck far outside, and Admiral Ashback at the back, six off the lead. Into the turn toward the three-eighths. It's Tizzy Twister by a nose. Sweet California keeping pace second. Two back to the gray. Warren's Queen Bee, third. Roman Empress, mix and match fifth, losing a little bit of ground. Four off the lead. Admiral Ashback, Sweet Duck at the back. Past the quarter pole and turning for home. Sweet California, the leader, narrowly. Tizzy Twister fights right back, and Tizzy Twister opens up a length. Sweet California getting tired. On the outside, Warren's Queen Bee is closing, and then Roman Empress, they're coming to the 16th pole, and Tizzy Twister with a two-length lead. Warren's Queen Bee clearly into second. Tizzy Twister strong. Tizzy Twister and Abel Cedillo by two and a half. Second went to Warren's Queen Bee, then Roman Empress, Sweet California, mix and match a distant fifth. Bellows music to complete the line. Good luck in the Rainbow Six. They're in the gate. And they're off. Roubaix shot out of there like a cannon. Beautiful Temple on the outside has speed. And now here comes Funny Feline in the yellow colors. And Funny Feline is up to take the lead. Summer Pudding is now a joint second, racing on the outside of Kitten's Kid. And down on the inside, it is Sheila's Charlie, now a joint second. Roubaix, who broke well, four lengths off the lead. At the rail, Current Mood is passing some rivals as they move by the half-mile pole. Mensa on tap is one from the rail and a little bit tight. They're followed by Yes, Your Grays. Beautiful Temple, who broke well, is now nine lengths off the lead. It's a length and a half to Rosie Forecast, who starts to make some progress, racing on the inside of Bellows Music. And at the back of the field is Sugar Apple. In the meantime, Funny Feline has opened up. Funny Feline by six lengths. Roubaix takes up the chase on the outside of Kitten's Kid, and they're followed by Beautiful Temple inside the eighth pole. Funny Feline, five-length lead, and showing no signs of weakening. It's Funny Feline to take them all the way. Funny Feline wins it by four. Roubaix was second. Beautiful Temple third. Current mood and Mensa on tap to complete the super high five.
And they're off. Noble reflection stumbled badly. Mongolian wind, affable, sent hard while five wide into the first turn. Phantom dances at the rail, showing plenty of early speed too, and disco ball in between. So disco ball and affable go on to lead around the first turn. Then it's holding the loot. Phantom dances on the inside, and in between those two is Mongolian wind. These five separated by about three lengths. A gap of four to Divine Armor, then Noble Reflection and Zimbo Warrior at the back. Down the back stretch, and it's Disco Ball past the 5 8 pole, leading three quarters of a length to Affable second. Two more hold in the loot, settled in third. Then Phantom Dance, Mongolian win, Noble Reflection, five off the lead. A length back to Divine Armor, who's two in front of Zimbo Warrior. Disco Ball. Comes to the 3 8 pole with a half-length advantage. Affable second, holding the loop, moves in while three wide. At the rail, Phantom Dance asks for more. Noble Reflection on the outside. Mongolian Wind hard ridden between those two. Divine Armor trying to launch a four-wide bid, making some headway. And Zimba Warrior at the back. They turn for home. Affable between. Disco Ball fights on. A length and a half, holding the loot is in third. They're followed at the rail by Phantom Dance. They're inside the eighth pole, and it's Affable and Disco Ball, nose and nose. Affable just in front. Disco Ball, brave along the inside, but yields grudgingly, and it will be Affable to score by a length and a half. Tight photo between Disco Ball and Phantom Dance, then Divine Armor and Zimba Warrior. Montgomery Memorial Race. In the sixth, we kick off our late pick four. No changes. Frost and Quinta Winta. They're all in line. And they're off. Gallo V is going out for the early lead. Freedom Lass has some early foot. Jimmy Smoke Carrot, Sky on Ice at the rail. Froh settles in mid-pack on the inside of Quinto Winter. Then Rose's Crystal and Agree to Disagree is at the back of the field. Gallo V, aggressive on the front end, has a two or three length lead as they round the first turn. Then it's Freedom Lass in second. Another two back to Sky on Ice third. Jimmy Smoked Carrot is about nine lengths off this loose leader and Froze racing just outside of her. Rose's Crystal is down at the rail. Kinto Winter remains reserved, as does Agree to Disagree. They're coming to the half mile pole with Gallo V to catch. It's Gallo V clear by four. Freedom Last cuts that lead down to three. Similar margin to Sky on Ice in third. Then Froze. Jimmy Smoked Carrot is on the inside. Kinto Winter in the red colors has about a dozen to make up. Another length back to Rose's Crystal and Agree to Disagree is asked to pick it up and does so now. Past the quarter pole and turning for home, Gallo V, Freedom Lass in hot pursuit. Sky on Ice swings into action on the outside. Center of the course, Kinto Winter and Agree to Disagree. Final furlong, Freedom Lass cutting into Gallo V's lead. Freedom Lass up alongside, takes the lead with a 16th to go. Gallo V back to second. It will be Freedom Lass. Freedom Lass wins it by two. Gallo V was second. Photo for third between Sky on Ice and Rose's Crystal. Then a photo for fifth between Jimmy Smoke Carrot and Agree to Disagree. Written by Juan Hernandez. Now, going with style. They're in the gate. And they're off. Clean start. Loudmouth, Prince Mayor, cover me up on the outside, and Parnelli. Those four in a scramble for early supremacy. There goes Harvard is just behind this quartet. Dan Samo understandably had to go very wide. Then going with style, back ring luck is second to last and Motown music at the back of the field. Six furlongs to run and it's the speedy loudmouth showing the way 
with Parnelli, just a neck back in second. Cover Me Up is on the far outside. Prince Mayor one from the outside. There goes Harvard is climbing and tugging just a touch, but he's well spotted, only three lengths off the lead. Then going with style, inside Dance Samo, back ring luck and Motown music. Half mile left to run, loudmouth with plenty of company. Parnelli ahead away second. A half length, cover me up, three wide. There goes Harvard, takes fourth. Prince Mayor fifth on the outside. It's two more to going with style, who's six lengths off the lead, followed by back ring luck, who starts to rally in the white cap. Another three back to Motown music, and Dance Samo was never interested. They're a quarter of a mile from home, and it's Loudmouth and Parnelli one, two. There goes Harvard, now tips out three wide to challenge. Cover me up is next. Back ring luck continues to make solid headway, has seven to make up in the final eighth of a mile, where Loudmouth the leader. There goes Harvard within two lengths now in second. Parnelli has softened up third. Back ring luck is fourth, and Loudmouth just keeps on going. And he ran them off their feet. Loudmouth and Juan Hernandez score by three and a half lengths. There goes Harvard second. Parnelli held third. Three-way photo for the rest between back ring luck, Motown music, and going with style. Double on the afternoon. Loudmouth was bred in California by Tommy Town Thoroughbreds. In fact, he was the only cowbred in the field. It pays to be cow. They're in the gate. Maybe I will, Fratches. And they're off in the Irish O'Brien. She's devoted came out smoothly. Here's Becca Taylor now rushing up, and Becca Taylor will set the pace. Eddie's new dream is up close, as is Maybe I Will along the inside. Now rushing up to engage Becca Taylor. Sensible Cat settles nicely. Five lengths off the lead. Sassy Serb is second to last. And Pulpit Rider at the back of the field. Becca Taylor is the boss down the hill. With Eddie's new dream, a joint second. Outside of her is the gray. She's devoted. And Maybe I Will is fourth. And tugging a little bit, three lengths off the leader. Sensible Cat and Sassy Serb between rivals. Three back to Pulpit Rider. A quarter of a mile to go in the Irish O'Brien. Becca Taylor has company. Eddie's new dream. She's devoted on the outside. Becca Taylor tries to sprint clear, but Eddie's new dream is right to her with a furlong left to go. And Sensible Cat is starting to close in the center of the course. Becca Taylor with her record on the line. Eddie's new dream up alongside. Becca Taylor just in front. Eddie's new dream. Here's the line. Eddie's new dream and Becca Taylor. It's too close to call between those two. Sensible Cat third. Photo for fourth. Presented by Smile Happy, the Kentucky Derby individual future pool favorite. A leading dirt sire and now is an exciting Kentucky Derby hopeful called Bernie Sams now and book your mare to eclipse champ. We've got some movement from Crash Corrigan, fidgety. And they're off. Exaltation in the center of the course. On a spree, matches strides in the early going. And Pratt gets Keystone Field into a good spot. Only three wide as they move into the turn. Then it's move over in fourth. Niles Channel with the pink sleeves along the inside. Followed by Frontier Market and Truth Seeker who are racing side by side. At the rail, Fly the Sky is about ten lengths off the leaders. Irish Heat Wave is next. Then Crash Corrigan and Liberal, the distant trailer. They swing on to the back stretch, and there's a battle between Exaltation and Honest Spree, side by side since the gate opened. Two more, Keystone Field, good trip third. Niles Channel at the rail, a close fourth, move over fifth. Then Truth Seeker, Frontier Market between horses, is about six lengths off the lead, an Irish heat wave with the orange cap just outside of them. A length and a half to fly the sky, Crash Corrigan, and now Liberal is underway from the back. Rounding the far turn, Exaltation, 
on a spree. Keystone Field makes his move. Irish Heat Wave with a four wide bid move over in traffic. Liberal will have to circle the field, but he is making solid progress as the field turns for home. Keystone Field takes the lead, opens up to Irish Heat Wave on the inside. Exaltation steadying a bit. Center of the course, Liberal continues to motor home under Ricky Gonzalez. And here comes Liberal from last to first in the late stages. Liberal gets up. Niles Channel was second. Irish Heat Wave third. Fourth between Fly the Sky and Keystone Field. One of my personal philosophies in life is to say thank you. I don't think you can say thank you enough. And certainly thank you is in order for yesterday. Did you see the total handle number here at the Great Race Place? In excess of $13 million. Now, of course, that was buoyed by almost the $4 million wagered in the pick six pool. But still, $13 million. I realize, and everybody here at Sandy to realize, is money does not grow on trees. And thank you so much for your wagering support. Of course, we couldn't do it without the horsemen. And if you've been watching the seminars this weekend, it's been a trainer seminar deluxe. Uh, on Friday, we had Bob Hess Jr. Yesterday, we had Mike Pipey. And it's my pleasure today to welcome in Gary Mandela. Gary, happy Sunday. Welcome to the seminar. Thank you for having me, Tom. Now, what's your busy morning been like? I ask all the trainers this same question. What time did you wake up? What time did you get to the track? What was your morning like? Alarm goes off 3.45 in the morning. Wow. Get here by 4.45. First set goes out at 5 o'clock. Last set goes out about 9.30 in the morning. Uh, and then you just get into taking care of the various nicks and scrapes and things like that and try to get breakfast in the stalls and feeding horses. Everybody kind of taking a lunch break by about 11. 
and uh, take a couple hours off, then come back for afternoon chores and getting the runners ready and schoolers if you have those two. Now, your dad runs three horses today, including one in the last race. When you have one in the last race, in my opinion, that would extend your day even longer than what's normal. It does by a little bit. And uh, we, if we didn't have anything running today, we'd have afternoon feed tubs in and wrapped up by about four. But she'll run about 4.45 and uh, about an hour and a half to get her cooled out, put her bandages back on, get everything taken care of. So it, it does extend it by a little bit. I mentioned your dad, of course, is a Hall of Fame trainer, Richard Mandela. You obviously assist him the best you can when you're not busy. You're a trainer yourself. Vivacious Vanessa comes to mind. How's she doing and when we're going to see her? She's very, very talented. She is and maturing and growing up mentally all the time. Baby steps, but she's getting better every single week. And uh, she had a nice breeze here on Friday. She'll have an allowance race that's in the condition book for April the 1st. So uh, hopefully the weather will stay away and we'll be able to keep her on turf and take a shot with that race and make another step forward and uh, try and get her uh, back into some of those Calibrate Stakes races later on this spring and summer. Forbidden Kingdom is certainly a very talented three-year-old in your dad's barn as well. We saw him win the San Felipe, but news broke about 48 hours ago that he spiked a fever. How's he doing this morning? He's doing fine. He had a fever for less than 24 hours. His blood work was never outside of normal ranges. It looked a little bit like it might be headed the wrong direction the first time we took it. The next time we took it, he's perfectly fine. He's bright and happy and looking to be playful and, and make mischief in the barn this afternoon. So I, I think we're going to be just fine there, and he'll get a breeze in next week and get right back on track, I believe, for the Santa Anita Derby. Gary, I mentioned the San Felipe victory by Forbidden Kingdom. Let's take a look at that replay. As we watch the replay, keep in mind the fractions that he set were 22.60 for the opening quarter and a half mile and 45.90. Kept on going, and as we watch the replay, let's cue that up right now. Also, look, pay attention to the gallop out past the wire. Let's listen to Frank Miramati describe the action in the San Felipe. Comes with a beautiful heart. Mike Smith jumps off. Armagnac's been a little bit keen since he got to the gate. And they're off in the San Felipe. Beautiful art hopped in the air. Happy Jack is sent out of there. Forbidden Kingdom sprints quickly. And Armagnac, the pace hot and heavy early on. Doppelganger is fourth on the inside of Cabo Spirit. Worst Reed Sanchez and Beautiful Art is at the back of the field. Forbidden Kingdom will set the pace and he has it by two lengths. Armagnac clearly into second and then Happy Jack back to third, about four and a half off the leader. It's another three back to Cabo Spirit racing on the outside of Doppelganger. Worst Reed Sanchez second to last and Beautiful Art at the back of the field. Forbidden Kingdom really rolling on the front end. Has it by three lengths. Armagnac second. Now a gap of seven or eight. Back to Happy Jack. There's room at the rail for Doppelganger who starts to advance. And Cabo Spirit outside of that pair. Another four lengths to worse Reed Sanchez. And Beautiful Art has trailed throughout. Three eighths of a mile to go in the San Felipe. And it's Forbidden Kingdom who has opened up a nine length lead. Doppelganger now comes after him in second. Armagnac a softened up third as they round the turn. And it's Forbidden Kingdom still with a commanding lead. Doppelganger will try to catch him in the final quarter of a mile. Cabo Spirit racing on the outside of Happy Jack. They turn for home. And Forbidden Kingdom still strong on the front end. A seven length advantage. Doppelganger is clearly second. But it is Forbidden Kingdom. A stellar display. Six length lead past the 16th pole. And what a performance from Forbidden Kingdom under Juan Hernandez in the San Felipe. They win by more than five. Doppelganger second. Happy Jack was third. Beautiful art finish fourth. Gary, as we watch the gallop out for Forbidden Kingdom, what were your thoughts when you saw the half mile posted at 45.90 seconds? Were you concerned or does this horse just have so much brilliant speed that you thought he could carry it all the way to the wire? You never know until they do it. You know that. Um, what I take and, and what I would advise people that if you're watching at home and you're not an experienced handicapper and you're learning how to watch race videos to determine whether horses should be bet the next time or not 
when you watch a horse like Forbidden Kingdom, you, you do have to be aware of how fast they're going in terms of a time, but you also have to watch how they're doing it. And one of the signs that you can look for is where their ears are. And horses that do what Forbidden Kingdom did there and their ears are flat back on their neck and they look like they're trying as absolutely hard as they can at those stages of the races. Those are horses, if they won the day that they did it, you're not necessarily going to put money on them the next time. Like that's going to be a repeatable process for them. When they prick their ears like he does and they start flipping them back and forth, like they're just looking around and taking it in, looking for somebody to come up to them. That's a really good sign. And it, it means more than the actual raw time does at that point, because it shows that the horse himself and the rider on top of him have options and that's going to be a big deal for him moving forward now obviously we're going to see him in with a different group next time probably a little bit more talented group they'll probably be closer and not as easy to dispense of at the five eights pole like it, what happened in the san felipe but when you see a good horse like forbidden kingdom doing things like that that's where you know that they're going to run beyond what distance limitations you may have thought they had in the past. For instance, in, in our horse's case, he hadn't won a route race before, so there was a question mark there. When you see that, that is something that you very much have to take seriously and leaves a lot of things on the table, like a mile and an eighth, like a mile and a quarter. And he deserves every chance to step forward off of that. And if he's going to stay the way that he was on the day of the San Felipe, it's going to take pretty serious horses to run him down the last part. Owned by the My Racehorse Syndicate and Spendthrift Farm. When did you and your dad know he had talent? In other words, were there whispers around when he, when uh, he was broken, maybe off, off track? Did you know the, with the first breeze? Like, when did you really realize you had something special on your hands? You could see the athleticism the first day we took him to the track. And he's just a horse that's very light on his feet. It comes very easily to him. He's out of a five-star day mare. So you didn't know exactly what horse he was going to be in terms of, was he going to be more that or more like American Pharaoh and a horse that could carry his speed around the ground. And he showed so much natural speed early on, which is why he was so effective in sprint races as a two-year-old, that you, you did wonder, how is this going to translate the further we go? But the, the seven eights races that he had last year showed us that it, it was definitely something that could happen. And he's just matured so well in the last few months, especially since the Del Mar meeting and, and his win there where he's such a classy horse now with the seasoning that he has and the way that he responds to all of his cues and everything that's asked of him. It's been very impressive to watch him transform mentally from a June two-year-old that looked like he could win a four and a half or five furlong race very easily to a horse that's still capable of that if you wanted him to, but he's also moldable in the way that he has become. And you could see an effort like the San Felipe. We're just scratching the surface to get some knowledge from trainer Gary Mandela. We're going to find out who he likes on today's eight race card. But before we do any of that, let's toss the microphone over to track announcer Frank Miramati and get the early changes on today's Sunday's card here at the spectacular great race place. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to San Anita Park. Here are the early changes. The track is fast. The turf is firm. Rail on our turf course is out 20 feet. The first starts the early pick five. Number one, Command Anna will carry two pounds over. Be advised that we have a super high five carryover from yesterday of more than $11,047. Great wagering opportunity in race one. In the second, start of the early pick four. Number four, surprise fashion, one pound over. And the corrected weight for number five, Prince Ricky, is 122 pounds. No apprentice allowance. Race three starts the rainbow pick six. Fresh pool today. No scratches or jockey changes. Fourth starts the late pick five. Scratch two, red penny night. Turning to race five. Scratch number 10, Gojo one. In the six, scratch three, Kate and Kid. Seven starts the golden hour pick four. It's the sensational star stakes. No changes. 
Eight starts the golden hour. Double scratch three, rocking redhead. Scratch eight, velvet slippers. Those are the changes on today's card. Enjoy your afternoon at Santa Anita Park. 58 minutes to the opener. Back to Quigley's Corner we go. Tom's guest today is Gary Mandela. Welcome back. We're talking horses with trainer Gary Mandela. Gary, good eight race card today. So let's kind of roll up our sleeves, no pun intended, and kind of dive right in. And of course, we'll deviate as uh, as conditions permit. But we kick things off here in race number one. And as you heard Frank Miramati say, it also it starts not only the 50 cent early pick five, but we also have a super high five carryover of $11,000. No one was able to solve the riddle of the super high five in yesterday's last race. Therefore, we have super, super high five carryover of $11,000. And we kick it off here going a mile and an eighth on the turf course for Cal Bread maiden special weights fillies and mares the turf rails today are at 20 feet we've got a field of it and the favorite is on the bottom uh she is a daughter of gray's and number eight busker alley two to one on john white's morning line owned by nick alexander nick can't say no will we see nick in the winner circle gary i don't think you will in this race anyways he's certainly no stranger <laughs> to it but isn't she an interesting filly having gotten through this condition but disqualified that day and she doesn't seem to be able to not have a clean trip since then but at the same time it feels to me like she's regressed a little bit since the day that she won whereas some of these other fillies are getting better and i would actually look to other directions dangerous to do phil damato the way his barn's going right absolutely but uh, i really think that tim yakteen has got a good shot with she's a little bit sassy in here figured everything out and turned the corner last time in part with a big change in tactics tyler bay's doing what he does best you let him get loose on the lead he tends to find some good results there and I don't know that anybody naturally is going to challenge this filly very effectively without being taken way out of their running style. So rails at 20 feet, chance to get loose on the lead. I think she's a little bit sassy. If she just replicates her last race or improves a half length or so, I think actually she's going to give the favorite everything she wants. You make a good point, Gary. And as we're looking at the screen, you also like the four barristers ride. We'll visit that particular filly in a moment. But in the case of she's a bit sassy, sometimes with these lightly raced mains, once they show early speed that they've never exhibited before in their career, it kind of explains not only to you as a trainer, but also to us as handicappers that maybe the light bulb has finally gone on sometimes when you think a horse needs to route, you used my filly, Vivacious Vanessa, at the beginning of the show. And that's a filly that I thought wanted to route all the time. And You debuted her going And I just turns. debuted her doing it because I actually thought sprinting her would make her speed crazy. Sometimes as a trainer, and you can see where Tim debuted this filly going long as well. Sometimes as a trainer, you make the wrong call there. You can see this filly just didn't show anything the first time. So Tim made the adjustment of backing her up into sprints. And sometimes, even though physically they're not a sprint type, just being in those can have the effect of what it did with this filly, where she got the idea a little bit more. The light bulb went on. Now she's showing speed, putting herself in a better spot in races. And I think that's going to pay off today. One of the uh, trademarks or attributes that your dad has, and you certainly have it as well, is exhibiting patience. How difficult is it to exhibit patience with racehorses? Not. You listen to them and you do what they tell you to do. It's not that hard. Um, you know, it it is a multifaceted job, but taking care of the horses is what we do first and foremost. And is it easy to figure out every horse the first day you have them in the barn and the first time you put your hands over their legs and the first time you see them gallop on the track? No, some horses are that way and you know exactly what you got. And you're right every single day that you're in their care. They're in your care, excuse me. Some days you don't figure a horse out until three, four races into their career. And some of your assumptions early on prove to be exactly wrong. Every trainer that's in the Hall of Fame will tell you about horses that they got wrong early on, made some adjustments, and things worked out in the end after they 
just sort of changed how they were treating these horses in terms of how they were setting them up for races or just change the types of races that they were in altogether. And you're it's right. Part I'm sorry, of it. No, I was going to say you're right because there's so many things involved also that we have to evaluate as handicappers, surface, uh, you know, changes, distance changes, blinkers changes, you know, lay six. I mean, it's just gelding. These are decisions you guys have to make and you don't make them lightly. A good horse on our circuit subconscious, perfect example of how gelding can affect a horse. And it's not easy to have a horse who's by tap it, his $300,000 stud fee wrapped up, and you've got this huge investment and take away his chance of becoming a stallion later on down the line. But he wasn't showing the ability that everyone around him knew he was capable of. That was an adjustment that was made, and you can see what the payoff has been. He's a superior racehorse now, and a lot of fun, and he's able to live up to his potential. Sometimes you get sent a horse who's completely bred pedigree-wise for the turf, but they need to be run on the dirt, and vice versa. Sprint horses need to be run long, and vice versa. You always have to stay open-minded dealing with horses the way that we do, and just keep paying attention. It's the most important thing. Always pay attention, that's for sure. John Henry comes to mind in terms of surface uh, changes as well. Absolutely. Let's see if we can get a payoff in race number two, Gary. It begins the 50 cent early pick four. This time we're on the main track, five and a half furlongs of the distance. $10,000 is the claiming tag. We've got a field of six, the morning line favorite number three, Storm Inside from the Jonathan Wong Barn. Six to five on the morning line, a new name in the jockey colony on the bottom, number six, Speed Pass, ridden by Francisco Ruby. I looked him up on Equibase. In his career, he's had 155 months. You can see he's not a bug boy, he's a journeyman. 155 months with eight wins 18 seconds and 25 thirds he had one mount last year he rode in december of 2021 at los alamitos for trainer ryan hansen they finished a good second so certainly he knows his way around horses but he doesn't get many mounts at least here on the major circuit what are your thoughts on race two gary he doesn't he doesn't know his way around santa anita that's the negatives the positive is he knows this horse no doubt about and it on him the last three times and if you're going to be in that situation with a rider to me you're better off to be outside in a sprint where he doesn't have to worry about how he's going to break along the rail how other riders are going to come right down on top of him, put pressure on him. A horse he knows breaking from the outside, he's going to have all the options in the world. And that's, I think, going to help him here and, and maybe make the difference. I like that Ryan's leaving him on this horse. He's got confidence in him. He knows him. He just won a nice open length win. It's not easy to win by four at Los Alamitos with the way that they run those races at night. So this horse is in very good form. The last horse that beat him came back and won very well. I don't think you can question that so much. Storm inside may go off as, as a favorite here, the way the morning line's put down. I wouldn't argue that so much. But I think you can make a case against him, given what he's doing today. He's won 11 races lifetime, all the credit in the world to him. But he's 5 for 15 on synthetic and 3 for 11 on a wet surface. He's only 2 for 17 on a true dirt track. And we didn't get nearly the amount of rain that they called for overnight. I'm not saying he's got no shot. God, he hasn't run a bad race in what his last 12 starts. He's really consistent. Love to own him. But if it's going to be the favorite and you're going to try and take a stand against the favorite, I, there's a little bit of a hole there in his statistics. And he's drawn to the inside of the, the other horse in the race that I think stands a very good chance here, which in this case, I'm going to take as a disadvantage. And I would go with the six over the three just because of that. Some small things, but I do think it's a two horse race and, and I would take it that way. Let's take a look at race number three, Gary, on today's eight race card. Begins the 20 cent rainbow pick six. We start fresh because yesterday was a mandatory payout. Did you see the payout on the 20 cent wager in excess of $26,000? Yes, it was difficult, but an incredible payout on the 20 cent pick six. Again, thanks to all of you for participating and congratulations to the very skilled and somewhat lucky ticket holders. And we kick things off today in race number three, going the marathon distance of a mile and a quarter on the turf course for Phillies and Mares. It's a starter allowance race. We've got a field of seven and the red hot number six, bye bye birdie is eight to five trained by leonard powell written by victor espinoza victor's had a lot of success both for you and your dad in the past surely has running a lot of good horses the tin man comes to mind right off the top and a bunch of others he's a great writer in his own right he's had a wonderful career he's probably going to be cruising on the lead here she's got to prove she can go a little bit further and extend herself out to a mile and a quarter which is an interesting problem for all of these fillies to have because you don't see a lot of them that have had an opportunity to do anything like it but this filly is so tough at this level. I mean, we're a long ways from that try in the Bayacoa here, class-wise. <laughs> and Leonard Pell's had a great meet. If anybody's going to have to take a shot at this filly, they're going to have to use a little bit more speed out of their horses than they probably have shown in the past. Not a lot. There's Some of these fillies have enough speed. But 
they haven't done it against a Philly like by by Birdie that's in the kind of form that she is. She's one of the more solid favorites on the on the program, I think, today. And I don't actually think you'll get eight to five on her and, and probably rightfully so if you don't. It's interesting, Gary, as we're looking at the graphic, you give a little bit of a shot to the five written by Flavian Pratt. Not sure I've seen this uh, in Southern California, at least recently. Flavian writes five, uh, has five months today. Not one of them is a morning line favorite, but of course, he's such a talented writer. And talking about your dad again, he was his biggest supporter early on when nobody had even heard of Flavian. He came over from France and hadn't written in this country before, but was was sent here to you know change and get better. He was just 20 years old, I think. And uh, he actually won a race for me down the hill with a filly named Macabre at about 30. I got 30 to one on her that day because nobody knew who he was. And, but it, it, like a horse like Forbidden Kingdom, Flavian Pratt, the first couple of times you saw him on a horse, you knew he had the potential to be as good as anybody in the country and has proven so. And uh, one day he'll get an Eclipse Award to go along with that. It's just a matter of time because he's won every big race that there is in this country. And it, as good a rider as he is, He's an even better human being. That's the really great thing about having him around and, and getting to work with him and go through races and strategize with him. He's, I, I can't say enough about him as a person. Really can't. And I hate to lose him. Hopefully it's only going to be for a couple months and he'll come back. But uh, He is certainly a mature man, mature way beyond his age, that's for sure. Very much so. Let's take a look at race number four. It begins the 50 cent late pick five, sprinting six furlongs in the main track for Phillies and Mares. Number of races today for Phillies and Mares. This one is a $25,000 claiming level. Non winners of two races lifetime. Scratch the two, leaves us with a field of five. Number three, Marie. First off, the claim for trainer George Papa Padromo is the eight to five morning line favorite. What are your thoughts on race four, Gary? Great claim. Tip of the hat to George on this one. You know, John runs a five year old mare for Maiden 20 that it only made one start, but she won easy. She was capable of beating better horses than Maiden 20, and, and George picked his pocket a little bit. But the downside of that is, as easily as she won, if you owned her, Tom and I would claimed her for you, wouldn't you have wanted to give her a try and a starter allowance without risking her for a 1,000%. So you've got the good news, bad news of that that you have to judge. Devil's advocate argument, she's going to be a lower price in this race. You make sure that you win. Again, she's a five-year-old filly. And you're only running for a little bit less purse money than if you'd run in a starter allowance race. And she's going to go off at even money, I'd say, by the time this one's all said and done. In a starter race, you'd certainly have a shot, but she might be more like five to two, three to one. So just trying to win a race. I think especially with the scratch of Kristen Mulholz, Philly, who takes some of the speed out of here and some of the quality out of this race for sure. She's just going to be too tough for these. You might even bounce a little bit off that big win for Maiden 20 and still be able to win this. If you just had to try a price in here, I'd maybe look to the outside with Bob Hess. Inform Philly, you can't make her the top pick off of a win on synthetic and coming back to dirt where she hadn't won previously. But Maiden 25s, you tell me if I'm wrong because you bet a lot more than I do. Maiden 25s at Golden Gate is the top level of Maiden claiming there as opposed to Maiden 20 or 25 down here at Santa Anita is below the Maiden 40s, the Maiden 50s, the Maiden 62.5. So you can say, relatively speaking, that beating a Maiden 25 bunch up there occasionally is tougher than a Maiden 20 bunch down here, and she deserves a, deserves a little respect from that angle. I wouldn't single her in here because she's got to prove her dirt form, but... Maiden 8 is the basement up at Golden Gate, that's for sure. So you make a very good point, Gary. And an additional point on the favorite number three, Marie. There were four claims in last time. George won the, say, won the shake. Be interesting to see if anyone dips in again for number three, Marie, in race number four. Race number five begins the 50 cent late pick four. We're sprinting six and a half furlongs on the turf course on the flat oval. This is for Maiden Special Weights. Scratch the also eligible number 10 will not compete. Leaves us with a field of nine. Make a number one a first time gelling. Gary, your dad has two runners in here. Number two, Naismith, coming off the long laugh and a first time starter by the num by the name of Take Action, who's number six in this race. Ironically, they both work together on March 11th and courtesy of our friends at XBTV, XBTV.com. We can watch that workout. They worked in company. Smith will be on the outside. Take action will be on the inside. Let's take a look at that work on March 11th. Yeah, both nice horses and have a lot of potential. I'm certainly not intending to pick one over the other in here. And you can see by the way that they work here. Take actions, a horse that like Naismith gets into a race right away. And I don't think he's going to be the kind of first time starter today that's going to get left at the gate from breaking green spin out and make a run, get whatever he gets from the outside. I, I do think he'll break well enough uh, 
and make himself involved early on that he'll end up sitting a pretty good trip here. Both going really comfortably to the top of the stretch. Nice to see a first-time starter like take action on the inside. Be just a neck back and not get intimidated about being down in there. And you can see him actually get a little bit clear from this stage. Maybe caught the, the rider on Naismith off guard a little bit who was waiting for him and then kind of has to hustle him back into position as they work out to the 7 eights pole. Not a lot of difference here in terms of take actions a first-time starter. Naismith's a horse that hasn't run in nine, ten months. You have to do the math for me on a layoff since April. But I just know he lost to Flightline. That's no disgrace. Flightline earned a 105 buyer speed figure in that race. It, and it tore his heart out a little use, bit. Yeah, and if you want to use that to analyze how good he's going to be, that's a fair assessment. But there's not anything like Flightline in here today. Basically, that's a race where he ran second, beaten about three lengths. Needed some time off. Looks like he's grown up and matured. I, I think in both of his races last year, he was a little rank, and that took away from his finishes. I think you're going to see a smarter horse than that today and down the line as as an older horse i think that's going to benefit him whether he'll end up a turf horse or a dirt horse that's kind of hard to say we'll find a little bit more about that today this race was going to fill dirt races don't always and he was ready to run so decided to go ahead and put both of them here instead of waiting for a different spot and take actions bred top and bottom like he should be a turf horse by more than ready which can go both ways warfront which i know from omaha beach can go both ways but more often than not going to end up being a turf horse so Good shot with both of them and looking forward to seeing what uh, they can do this afternoon. Six to one on both of the Richard Mandela trained runners in race number five. Take note, the, the lukewarm morning line favorite from the Doug O'Neill bar number eight trainer, please. Let's turn the page, Gary. Take a look at race number six. Spraining six furlongs in the main track for maiden claiming. Phillies and mares, $20,000 of the claiming tag. Field of eight after the scratch of number three, Kate and Kid, who will not compete. Morning line favorite who's had a few chances is number four, excuse me, is number six for love, not money. Five to two on the morning line. What say you about race six? A lot of chances. <laughs> uh, Spread so, race for the for the so players, right? Not for me. I, okay. I, this is the kind of race, and and again, you tell me if I'm wrong. I just go with the two first time starters because I think everybody in here's had enough chances. Like, granted, the Philly down on the rail for Vladimir, who's had a heck of a meet, mock ten hair on fire. Only had the one race. Didn't show enough for me to to really use her, and not a sign of confidence to send her off to Turf Paradise for the first time. I don't think either. That being said, I think everybody in here has had enough shot that the first-time starters hold a big edge. Steve Miotti, we see him do this all the time, doesn't have to work his horses really fast to have them ready to go first time out. He got flabby, and he tipped his hand there. He definitely tipped his hand here. He wasn't trying to play coy or, or wait for the next time here. He got the best rider he could. He's trying to win today. I think he found the right spot to do it, and I think this four-year-old daughter of Boisterous will be pretty tough. Victor Garcia maybe less noticeably though does the same he in these maiden claiming first time starter spots wins his fair share without showing them off first time early and tyler bays again guy that knows how to get one out of the gate in good order put yourself in a good position from the outside uh, difference between the two knowing i'm going to get a better price on the outside horse if i had just a little bit more faith five-year-old first time starter i'm going to go with steve miotti on the inside just because of that um, but don't be surprised if Victor pulls something off here. That's one of the better price plays on the card today, I think, actually, is to include that filly in your ticket somehow. You talked about the uh, ma five-year-old maiden, uh, Melgito, on the bottom from the Victor Garcia barn. If you were a horse player playing this race, if you happen to be in the paddock, what would maybe be some of the things you're looking for? Are you looking at her feet? Are you looking to see maybe you know how alert she is, her body type? Like, obviously, she's not debuting until she's five years old, so she's had some sort of potential problems along the way, but what would you be looking at to evaluate her chances in the race? just fitness just overall health you know we're, we're getting to the time of year here as i look around us and you can see the sun's out and it's been out for a bit you can see how the the trees are changing and everything horses coats are going to change as well and it, this is the time of year where you can make more accurate paddock plays than you can in the doldrums of the winter months when it's raining and it's cold and all horses are growing their hair out when horses are ready to fire big their coats will change and they'll get bright much faster than horses that aren't. And, and you'll see those dapples. You'll see the gleam in their eye a little bit better. And it, how horses look going to the post is a, a place where you can find some value that maybe you can't see on paper. 
four and nine, nine and four in race number six. So says trainer Gary Mandel. Let's take a look at race number seven. It's our feature race on the card. It's sensational star stakes, $100,000 guaranteed for Calbreds coming down the hillside turf course. Six and a half furlongs is the distance. It's a field of eight brickyard ride. Very talented, fast horse from the Craig Lewis barn. Son of clubhouse ride is the eight to five morning line favorite. Also keep in mind race number seven begins the $1 golden hour pick four linking our last two races with the last two races at Golden Gate. Yesterday's pad, it wasn't all that difficult yet. It paid in excess of $2,000. We'll see if we can string together some winners today in, in today's Golden Hour Pick 4. We need help in this race, Gary. Before we talk about the race, talking about Sensational Star, automatically you think of Bill Sparr and what a tremendous claim that was. Talking about KG trainers that we've been doing a lot of so far during these 40 minutes, yeah. Bill also fits in that category of KG. He's on a roll lately, too, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yes, we he call is. him the professor out here <laughs> quite often around the apron in the mornings. And he is – you ask me what time we get up when we get started. You can't beat Bill to the there barn, are can you? very few people that beat Bill to the barn. And he is out here at the crack of dawn every morning watching everything like a hawk. Really good guy on top of it. And it's it, he's, he's a good guy to be around. And anytime you can just listen in on a story he's telling, any shot you can glean anything horsemanship-wise off of him, you always take advantage. And it reminds me of the Studi brothers as well and Barry Abrams <laughs> and uh, Hector Marino and Henry Marino, I should say. And, uh, you know, old timers like that. Clockers Corner can be a lot of fun. Can be. You can pick up a, a few things here and there. That's for Let, sure. Let's see if we can pick up something here in race number seven, Gary. Do you like Brickyard Rider? You're going to turn your attention elsewhere. How do you not like a horse that's 10 for 20? That Especially when he's in against these calibrates. He wins on any surface, any distance. It just doesn't matter. He's just that good a horse. And Craig's done such a good job managing this horse's career. And you, you can see that with the wins and the money that he's won. It, it's been a lot of fun to watch that. And I, today he's just the horse to beat again. Juan knows him like the back of his hand. He can't be the easiest horse to ride in the world. You can see that in some of his races. But Juan knows him really well. In against Calbred's doing something that he knows how to do and loves. He's going to be really, really tough to beat today. From a handicapping perspective, on the Golden Hour Pick 4, what percentage of tickets are going to single Brickyard, Ryan? Just a lot. Assume. So there's money to be made if you can take a stand Absolutely. and beat him. You have to be a contrarian. I, I don't see it. I, I'm not going to be a contrarian and pick against him on top. But if you were going to try to, you were going to play a backup ticket that didn't to try to get it for a little bit more. I, I, he's not a huge price, but Indian Peak is dropping out of a graded stake. He was second against Barraza, one of the few horses on this circuit that I would give a chance to beat Clubhouse right going down the hill right now, as good as he's gotten. So that's a strong race that he's coming out of for sure. The turn back in distance maybe showed us that Ruben Alvarado had a really good idea to, to change him up and get him down the hill at this stage of his career. Might have found his new form cycle with that and a way for him to turn the tables on Brickyard, right? Again, it's five to two second choice off the strength of where he ran in the San Simeon, but in a multi-race wager, maybe he'll be a little bit bigger than that. I'm just throwing it out there, but those, those are the two horses. I, I think it's a two horse race. Indian Peak gets the services of Johnny V. Johnny Velasquez in the saddle. And you can see Indian Peak's last performance that Gary was mentioned in the San Simeon off slow in a field of eight, trailed early, then made that good late kick to finish a good second. Perhaps improvement is forthcoming, as Gary mentioned, now that maybe they found the secret that this horse wanted to sprint all along. We close things out in race number eight, going a mile and an eighth on the turf course. It's for Phillies and Mares, allowance optional claiming types, non winners of two other than two scratches in the race. Scratch three, Rocking Redhead, as well as number eight, Velvet Slipper. That Velvet at slippers that leaves us with a field of nine the morning line favorite number five bubbles on ice lukewarm seven to two morning line favorite couple of uh, maintenance notes here gary first of all five dollar golden hour daily double time beginning in race eight linking Nyra last race here at san Anita with the last race at golden gate also great live racing resumes on friday here at the great race place eight race card begins at one o'clock p.m pacific time but that's far off in the future we need a winner to close out the week gary tell us who it's going to be no, Moonlight Doro is what we're hoping. We're leading <laughs> we her sure over. are. She's a very nice filly. Stakes quality filly for sure. But Looking to see what she'll do on the turf course. She's always been made like a filly who would appreciate it. Her races were so good on the dirt. And there was no reason to change that up until the way that she ran in the La Cañada. And now seems to be the time that she's get her away from a filly like as time goes by, maybe put her on the turf and see if she can run to her confirmation and take a try against these. This is a good race, though. This did not come up an easy allowance race to take a shot on the turf for the first time. 
Gary, her uh, last rate, or excuse me, her last workout came on March 16th. It was on the main track. Of course, she's debuting on the turf today. But let's take a look at that workout on March 16th. She actually worked a solo for about half the workout and then got joined in company by Bob Hessrunner. But what did you think of uh, Moonlight Dioro's workout here on March 16th? Well, you know, Moonlight Dioro, as you can see that in her past, she's won the Los Virginas stakes. So she's proven for quality. But what is she lacking right now? A little bit of confidence. And every once in a while as a trainer, you're just looking for a maintenance work. She's plenty fit. Just wanted to let her kind of blow off some steam and, and cruise a half mile and show us what kind of shape she's in here, thinking we're going to enter her in a week. And it just falls in your lap. that There's a horse ahead of you that unintentionally you can work with. And without being asked, you can just kind of catch and get past. And that gives a horse a lot of confidence. You know, when you're out in and around Lexington or any part of California where you see horses raised and you see those young horses just tearing off and racing each other across a, a 10 acre field or whatever it is. This is what they love to do. And we hadn't been able to give her this in a racing situation in a while. And it just worked out that way. And I think that's really going to help her today. Never asked in the workout at all. And you exactly. can see the gallop also very, very strong. So certainly four to one seems like more than a fair price on your dad's horse. Moonlight de Oro in race number eight to close it out. Gary, I can't thank you enough for the time and insight you provided with us today. You do a spectacular job. You're a credit to the industry. Keep up the good work. Good luck with Forbidden Kingdom. Good luck with all your runners as well. And thanks for the time. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. It's always fun. Thanks to all of you for watching as well. Hope you had some fun. Good luck today at the races, everybody. Make some money. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park. The track is fast, the turf firm, rail on the turf at 20 feet. Here are the changes. First race starts the early pick five. We have a super high five carryover of $11,000. In this race, number one, Command Anna, two pounds over. Race two, number four, Surprise Fashion, one pound over. And the corrected weight for number five, Prince Ricky, is 122 pounds. Third race starts the Rainbow Six. Fresh pool today after the mandatory payout yesterday. Race four, scratch two, red penny night. Fourth race, take out the two. Late pick five starts with the fourth. In the fifth, scratch 10, Gojo one. Late pick four starts with race five. Sixth race, scratch three, Kate and Kit. Race six, scratch number three. Seventh is the Sensational Star Stakes. Start of the Golden Hour, pick four with no changes. And in the eighth, start of the Golden Hour, double, scratch three, Rocking Redhead, and eight, Velvet Slippers. Enjoy your day at the Great Race Place. 26 minutes to post. 